Thank you, Nicole. You're very welcome. So, it looks like, uh, gentlemen, that we are the only thing that uh, stands between this crowd and a cocktail. Uh, so, yes, the game is definitely on. Uh, so let's get right into it. So, Alan, if I can start with you, um, I, I read recently that, uh, that it wasn't necessarily your CEO, Tony Fernandez, who came up with the wonderful idea of getting behind eSports. It was actually his son. Uh, which I found quite interesting. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know, how AirAsia decided to embark on this journey and, and uh, a little bit about your strategy behind uh, eSports? Yeah, um, in fact, his son was the one who told uh, Tony Fernandez, our owner of the airline, that, hey, Dad, you should get involved in eSports. But of course, um, Tony has a lot of other big businesses to handle. So we went on ground and uh, created our own eSports club for employees back in June 2017. Started off with 10 employees, and now we have 200 over in a company that is part of uh, eSports club. They play multiple games in PC, mobile, console. And then subsequently, we sponsored Mineski, a Dota team in Southeast Asia. They were one of the best in the region. And subsequently, we sponsored Alibaba's uh, eSports tournament, WESG within uh, three months, and also acquired a majority share in Aerosia Science, a mobile esports team recently. And we even made an announcement, we're going to take over a shopping mall in uh, Malaysia and convert it into an esports hub to create uh, job opportunities in the esports space. It's not just about playing games, it's also about um, developing talents, uh, shoutcasters, production crew, etc. So quite a 360 approach. The full mall. Full on. It just be becomes purely an esports center. That's right. Uh, it's in Klang, about 30 minutes away from Kuala Lumpur city center. Wow, amazing. And Santi, yes, Karina uh, is now the leading digital entertainment group by revenue in, in greater Southeast Asia, uh, and now a major advocate and organizer of esports events uh, around the region. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your, your strategy and uh, I think in, in particular, uh, the Garena World uh, event that took place in Bangkok, which had, I think, some astounding numbers this past year. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, as you said, actually, the C Group is, you can say, it's an artist formerly known as Garena. Uh, for the longest time, uh, we were called Garena. That's our original business. It's online games and a big support of esports. Um, so, it's very deep in our blood and DNA, you know, that we want to push esports and push games. Um, and I've been running a lot of tournaments. Each year we run like over hundreds of tournaments across the region. Our region home markets are ASEAN plus Taiwan. Um, so being very active, in, in Indonesia included. Um, Garena is the flagship tournament event um, that we had. Uh, was earlier this year in Bangkok, my hometown where I'm from. And um, over it's a two-day event. Uh, we had... 240,000 people turn up to watch offline over the two days in Baitek Bangna. And we have about 10.5. At the venue. Itself. That's at the venue. And we have 10.5, uh, roughly, million uh, viewing online over those two days. So it's huge events. And what's amazing about it, Cam, is that when you go to the event, the Garena World, it's not just the youth who are gamers. You actually see families who are actually you know, trying to, parents go there, trying to understand the, uh, the event, the phenomena that is esports. So it's actually by a variety of people, really exciting. And actually, since we're in Indonesia, it's proud to say that you know last week we just had another uh, one tournament here, which is the first I think battle royale tournament um, of that of that size in in Jakarta. Actually, uh, our game is called Free Fire. So it's one of the popular games here. So we just had one here. Hopefully, that's the start of something more that we're going to do in the future. Wow, fantastic! And speaking of all ages, I guess you know I, I actually kind of grew up on the on, on the playing fields, and and I feel like uh, I may have already aged out of the the gamer revolution. So, you know, in terms of you know my next question is you know could you tell us and uh, you know what what actually are the parallels and differences between esports and traditional offline sports, and why you think gaming is experienced such exponential growth? I'll start with you, Alan. Okay, um, this is my personal observation when we first uh, researched about the market. So, uh, well, I, I'm from the David Beckham era, guys, like watching Manchester United, Liverpool on TV. And what's different about esports compared to traditional sports is this. 
in uh, traditional sports, yeah, David Beckham is on the field playing, or he does one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews with the media. You don't have a chance to interact with him, per se. In the eSports world, it's different. The David Beckham in eSports, like Ninja and all that, you, you can interact with them, and they actually uh, recognize you. They'll say out your name, Cam, Alan, Santi, like, wow, David Beckham saying hi to me, per se, you know? So that's the difference in eSports versus traditional sports. Very interactive, and uh, the community is very strong, and uh, you can play each other. It's, uh, you can play online, you can be either your beanbag, uh, waiting at a train station, or even sitting on your throne at home on your to toilet seat, right? Nobody knows, because you're playing online. <laughs> it's different from traditional sports, you have to go to a physical location. So that's one of the key differentiators. In terms of apparel, I've been to eSport events on ground, I've seen like, wow, they're actually very fanatic, they are very uh, passionate, they scream, they shout, they cry, they cry guys, when the team loses. So it's, to them, it's their form of entertainment, their form of sport. Whether you understand or not, the next generation is really moving towards that direction, the millennials and Generation Z digital natives. That's great. Thanks, Santi. Yeah, I think I'll touch on a very important point about esports and games these days. It's not just games, but it's actually um, there's a very heavy element of the social uh, element to it as well, that people actually interact with each other, and that interactions really help. Another thing that um, if you talk to, at Garena, we of course have a lot of hardcore gamers as you know, ex-esport players, and you ask them what, you know, why are they so passionate about this field? They said, you know, games, competitive games is the ultimate equalizer. So unlike sports where you have to be, you know, physically superior, um, in esports, whether you're less physically gifted, whether you're tall or short, um, you're big or small, um, whatever gender you are, you can play the same games and you can win, you can do well. So that's sort of very inclusive, very, you know, across the board, doesn't matter where you are. And actually we have a lot of inspiring cases I have seen personally, whereby um, kids from relatively low income family have managed to become, you know, top esport players representing the nation in international competition and earn money to actually support the whole family. So it's really inspiring in that sense. Uh, excellent, thank you. So speaking of, yeah, in terms of getting deeper into to the market, so I mean, each, each market as you expand across the region must come with its own unique set of challenges uh, and opportunities. So what, what do you guys find are the key enablers uh, for building and sustaining a strong esports ecosystem? Uh, here in Indonesia and or uh, your other priority markets across the region? Um, for me personally, I feel that both uh, the government, government sector plays an important role to um, legitimize esports in the sense of uh, saying positive stuff about it. Like uh, recently in Asian games in uh, Jak Jakarta over here, there's esports uh, as an exhibition games. You get a medal but no points. But uh, the government is really supportive. And even next year for SEA Games, guess what, guys? You got points and you get medals in eSports in Philippines 2019. So government really plays a crucial role. And second part would be the media. So mainstream media example in Malaysia, they've been very supportive and um, very aggressive. Um, they even have an eSports dedicated journalist inside the mainstream media. Like Astro has one, uh, Media Prima in Malaysia has one. So even in, uh, I recently see a lot of uh, news in Indonesia supporting the eSports initiative, and even a lot of uh, politicians attending those functions, and uh, it legitimizes it more. Yeah, yeah I definitely agree with um, Alan's point that policy make makers uh, have a big role to play. Another thing that um, is, a, is a really a huge trend, actually, that's changing the eSports and game, gaming world a lot is the, the mobile um, revolution, whereby a lot of people now can access games through mobile phones and play on mobile phones. And uh, in, especially in places like Indonesia, that's quite a big game changer because you don't have to go necessarily go to cyber cafes, you don't have to buy a PC anymore. Now you can access wherever you are, whether you're outside Jakarta, whether you're in the mountains or in the islands, you can do that. But one of the key constraints that we also found, especially in emerging markets, including Indonesia, is that because some of the games are designed for really high spec mobile phones, so when, if you don't have the high spec phones, um, uh, these kind of memory requirements, RAM, make cause a lot of latency issues, it's a lot of interruption to the games. And if you play games, you know that, you know, the difference in between one second is between death or alive, right? That's the whole thing. So um, that's one of the big pain points still. And so to tackle that, we, we uh, uh, in December last year, Garina shifted from this publisher of games to self-develop games, so develop from our own studio. Um, that how Free Fire came about. And the Free Fire value proposition is very clear to say like, 
we want to tap into global emerging market consumers like Indonesia. We want to design it specifically optimized for lower spec phones so everyone can play this game easily without any interruption and smoothly. And that's one of the reasons why Free Fire did very well uh, right now. We have about daily active user peak about 27 million people. That means 27 million people log in every day to play the games. About 200 million registered players. Um, and that's why, you know, as I speak at the beginning, it's really exciting to start a bit of a Free Fire tournament here in Indonesia last week because it's where we're actually one of the top grossing games here. And how many users do you have in Indonesia at present? Of those 27 million, how many are here, do you know? So we, we, we tend not to give uh, the split by, by, by countries, but uh, Indonesia is one of the places that, that Free Fire is doing very well. Another region, unexpectedly actually, is Brazil. So actually we, didn't hop, we, not, we did not have any presence there before because we focus on our region, but now becoming game developers mean that we, there's, you know, there's no boundaries. We can actually go anywhere. And so the game was become top uh, grossing games in Brazil. Once it hit Brazil, it goes to Mexico, it goes to Argentina. So now our team have to start exploring how to cover those markets. So it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a problem, but it's a nice problem to have. <laughs> Sounds that way. So for the, for the games themselves, like Free Fire, you, uh, you, your, your key markets are, are greater Southeast Asia, but when you're developing a game like Free Fire, that would be distributed all over the globe. Globally, yeah. We, I think um, selling in 30 markets right now. So it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. Uh, Arena of Valor uh, yeah, as so well? I, yeah, Arena of Valor is still very much for, is for the region. So it's still great in Southeast, Southeast Asia, so ASEAN plus Taiwan. And uh, in that area, we, we, we you know, it's still a big focus. Um, we do a lot of localization of, of content for that too. So actually for Indonesia, we recently introduced one of the hero characters, Wero Sablang, which is I think in line with, uh, you guys just had a movie here. Uh, Wero Sablang. Sablang. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. it was released so this we, year. So we actually, it's, it's a playable character in Arena of Valor now in Indonesia. And I, uh, we are actually launching that so it could be regional. So not just Indonesian players, but actually regionally who play AOV can use a Wero Sablang. Excellent. Now that leads me to my next question. So in the VOD space, we often talk about localization. So localization from a content perspective, localization from a marketing perspective. So what, what kind of social and cultural acceptance or challenges do you face as you expand? Um, and how do you build accessibility and actually inclusion uh, through your games or, or events? Alan. Um, what we noticed that different countries, they have different game titles that are more popular. Like example, in Malaysia, our uh, eSports club, they a, lot, a lot of them play Mobile Legends, but in Thailand, they play a lot of uh, ROV, also known as AOV, one of Garina's game. So we noticed that, um, for me personally, I feel that the game, the game developers and the games that people play depends on the kind of language. If it's localized, then they will most likely play it, and Garina has been doing a good job. Um, having local on-ground teams and having a local community managers to support the market. So it's very important because like you talk Southeast Asia, uh, which countries majority speak English? Singapore, Malaysia, and uh, not, not many, right? And Philippines, right? So the rest, you need to localize it. Like in Indonesia, you have to have Bahasa Indonesia. Yeah, exactly. Bahasa Indonesia, key for this market. Anything to add uh, on that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, in addition to, to localization of content, like creating the local heroes like we were Sablang, we also uh, tried recently another initiative whereby we try to get uh, players and people to be involved in the game development itself. So what we did in Thailand is uh, we have things called amazing ROV design contests. Um, ROV is basically Arena of Valor, but in the entire version. Um, amazing is taken from Amazing Thailand Tourism. So we're doing this in collaboration with the Tourism Authority of Thailand. The idea is we, tell, we, we ask uh, people to submit ideas for costume designs for their characters. So people cool. can send in, but it has to illustrate some Thai-ness, some Thai culture or related to Thai tourist, uh, tourist des destinations to promote tourism. And uh, so we have tons of, of ideas coming in, and they're all fascinating. They're all, the studio was blown away by you know, how good people are developing all these ideas. And we already got a winner. So the winner got a prize um, given, cash prize given directly by the uh, Minister of Tourism and Sports in Thailand. And the design is now going to studio in Tencent to develop that real character. So in a few months' time, that personalized, customized design done by a Thai person 
will be actually used in the games. Well, that's very cool. I'm sure there are people in the audience wondering if you're going to bring that to Indonesia at some point. Yes, I think it's, yeah, it's definitely uh, on agenda. <laughs> All right, so this is a very self-serving question. Um, can we talk a little bit more about the various games, or the, sorry, the various genres of esports uh, and the major events themselves? Um, you know, as I'm learning and understanding, the prize money can be quite incredible. Uh, I've seen some, you know, figures that are well into the 20s and you know, possibly even reaching 30 million uh, dollars in prize money. And I understand as well that there's a significant, significant level of crowdfunding involved in certain events. So I'd love to learn more about that. Well, maybe I can share a bit. Like when I first did some research last year, I found out like a game like Dota. Okay, so esports world, there's uh, PC games, mobile games, and console games. Console is your Xbox, PS4. So for PC, some of the popular games is like League of Legends and Dota. So Dota started back in 2011. It's called the International, 1.6 million US dollars prize money. Um, it's contributed by Valve, the owner of the game. And subsequently, every year, year on year, it goes up, the prize money. And this year in uh, Vancouver, it was uh, two, 25 million US dollars prize money. And it's crowdfunded 100%. Um, 1.6 million pumped in by Valve, the owner, and the balance all is contributed by the community. 23 and a half million. That's right. <clears throat> How it works is like a few months before the main event, the TI, they call it, the international, they will have a special item. And this item, example, they sell it for 999 US dollars. And 25% of that revenue goes to the prize pool. And the 75% gets to be kept by Valve, the owner. So imagine the kind of money they make, right? And uh, of course, other publishers like Tencent, they have League of Legends, and uh, they do it in big stadiums. Um, last year, I was in Birdnest Stadium, Beijing National Stadium in China. I was there. So imagine inside the stadium, full house, uh, 50,000 crowd, and uh, they're watching a big screen, right? When I show the photo to my bosses, like, hey, is this fake news? You know, is this uh, Photoshop? I'm like, no, I'm there. It's real. And this year, League of Legends World Finals was held in Korea, South Korea, Incheon Stadium. Again, full house, packed stadium, tickets sold within seconds. Yeah, so it's a whole wave coming. And even in Indonesia right now, you have malls being filled up to the brim, packed with people watching the events. So it's just going to get bigger, guys. Oh, amazing. And Santi, for you, genres and that, that you're seeing, where you're seeing growth and, and events where you're, you know, the upcoming events for you guys that are very exciting. Yeah, um, well, you know, I, I briefly mentioned that, uh, you know, the case whereby we have one of the local heroes from a low-income family who actually represent uh, the nation. That's actually, that, that, that person is, is, is from Thailand. And uh, he represented Thailand uh, to play at the Arena of Valor uh, Globe Competition. Last time was in July in uh, LA. And uh, Thailand won the second place, very close uh, to, to South Korea. Um, and we're going to have a next one, and that's coming up uh, actually in less than two weeks' time. That was, December, that was a worldwide League of Legends. Worldwide, League, uh, worldwide uh, Arena of Valor. One. Uh, Arena of Valor, sorry. Yeah. So the next one is going to be even bigger than that in terms of prize pool, and it's going to be uh, held in Bangkok, actually. So that's 16th of December. It's the final. Um, it's Arena of Valor. It's actually one of the biggest uh, mobile uh, tournaments that we're going to see. Um, and I think what's interesting about it is that you start to see the synergies and the spillover impact that this could lead to industry like tourism as well because people from around the world is traveling to see and support their teams in this country. So that is this sort of emerging intersection of esports and tourism together, which you know is very interesting for, for uh, players like Asia as well. Oh, great. I think we've got a couple of minutes left, so maybe we'll touch on what we're looking at uh, ahead of us. So, uh, given the incredible growth internationally and with Asia leading the way, uh, what are your predictions uh, for the future of esports going forward? Alan. Um, so you can't say you can't give a three to five year plan in esports because like, things change so fast. Uh, one day in esports is like uh, 100 days in, normal, in real life. Um, the news keep changing rapidly. Like a few months ago, you got PUBG leading the way for Battle Royale, and out of nowhere, Fortnite comes in the scene, right? Uh, Fortnite is really big, and uh, their revenue is like 500 over million US dollars a month. So uh, things change very fast. So my prediction is it's open. That's the prediction, man. <laughs> you can't tell nowadays. It's uh, difficult. It's moving too fast. It's so fast. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I definitely, you know, <laughs> echo with that sentiment. But I, if I have to make one prediction, I, I would think that apart from growth that we'll see is we'll see a trend of broadening 
in, in many dimensions. One is around the audience. Um, of course, we're trying to be part of that by making games, um, best games available you know, to low spec phones, to wherever emerging markets get over, over emerging market constraints. But I think through that, we also see wider set of audience that we watch. It's not gonna be just gamers anymore. You're gonna have more male, more female participation in games. We're gonna see actually older people actually get, start to get far more familiarized um, uh, with the games. Um, people outside the capital region now can access in good content. So that's gonna be much broader uh, set of audience. And what comes with that is that you're gonna see more broader set of investors and sponsorship as well. Because now you have you know, more eyeballs, more wide variety of people see some consumer companies. A lot of investment, a lot in sport teams gonna come in and invest more. And then lastly, on, on top of that, you're gonna see some broadening of um, the talent needs for the industry too. And that's gonna be one of the bottlenecks in the sense that constraints that the talents, we need a caster, we need a programmer, we need designers. Um, what we learned from looking in place where eSports quite developed, like Taiwan, um, we see actually uh, that they create a lot of jobs and also quality jobs. So people who are working in gaming and eSports industry in Taiwan earn on average about 17% higher than national salary. And the bulk of that is very clear. If you look at the breakdown, it's things like artists, design, they can earn much higher in the eSport related, games related industries. So it creates, gonna create more job, but that's gonna be also one of the constraints where we need more talents, need more youth to go in there. Sorry, Sorry. I'm just gonna add in one yeah. quick one. So I, my personal prediction, a safe prediction, <laughs> mobile is gonna overtake everything else in the future. It's really overtaking. Um, a lot of Southeast Asian markets is mobile first market. And even we see like iFlix just entered the esports scene recently, uh, sponsoring and broadcasting a mobile Star League. It's a Mobile Legends tournament, and uh, yeah, you see a lot of uh, a lot of mobile movement in the market. And thank you for that. Um, uh, on, uh, iFlix is getting into the market as well. So uh, on on that note, uh, Santi, you may be a very popular man at drinks. Just mentioning the uh, the substantial increases in in, in wages and in payment for uh, for developers. Um, but we've got the, a few thirsty people out there that I'm sure are ready. Uh, but thank you, Santi, and thank you, Alan. I uh, really appreciate your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen.